And you will say in that day, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, and proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done glorious. Let this be made known in all the earth. Shout and shake, sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Please rise as we sing together hymn number one. O come, O come, Emmanuel, hymn number one.
gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. Please remain standing as we sing Psalm 148, which is found in our hymnals on page 104. Page 104.
Amen and amen. Please stand and lift up your heads to hear the good news, which this morning comes to us from Romans chapter 3, verse 23 through 25, where it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. A great gulf exists between us as sinners and God in His holiness. Who will save us? But we as the people of God have been justified, that is, declared right by the salvation provided through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this has come to us as a gift of grace. It doesn't matter what you think, it doesn't matter what you feel, but what matters is what the Word of God declares. Therefore, as a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ, I declare to you, the people of God, that your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right to do so. Truly, it is fitting, right, and beneficial to give thanks to you at all times and in every place. O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, Therefore, the angels and archangels and all the company of heaven and with the church on earth, we praise and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given to you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you might be, you were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift, as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. Please stand in respect for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel text this morning is Mark chapter 13, verses 24 through 37. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you will know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these signs take place. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to you, o Christ. Concerning the apocalypse, what you know might not be so. Our text this morning is Mark chapter 13, verses 20 through 37. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon us this morning that we might see your word in all of its truth. We might tremble before it, and we might look forward with eager expectation for the final advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. There was an owl hooting outside my office window. Now, there's nothing wrong with an owl hooting outside my office window, but there was something wrong with the timing. It was almost noon, in the middle of the day, not the dark of the night. 
the timing was off. Timing is also an issue for how we view apocalyptic events in the Olivet Discourse. We assume the timing is only related to the second coming or advent of Jesus. But what if the timing is off? This morning we'll look at this subject in Mark's account of the Olivet Discourse as we ponder the subject of Advent Apocalypse. Advent Apocalypse. Go to open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 13. We're going to begin there in verse 20. Mark chapter 13, beginning in verse 20. And it starts off here by saying this. By the way, we're just dropping down into the middle of this discourse. In fact, the section that's put in the Revised Common Lectionary is even shorter than this. But I don't think that does justice to the context of this chapter. So in verse 20 it says, And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved, but for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. Now likely most of you have been exposed to all kinds of prophecy teachers in your life as Christians, people coming on television, but what I'm going to present to you in my interpretation comes from the post-millennial perspective. And post-millennialists in history are great and deep. For example, John Owen, the great reformer, was one. Theologian, Jonathan Edwards, the Princeton theologians, Charles Hodge, B.B. Warfield, and in our day, R.C. Sproul. So here we are in the Olivet Discourse. What's the timing of these events? The timing of this apocalypse has to be tied to the destruction of the temple. Take a look at the context. Go up to verse 1 here. For chapter 13 is all part of one discourse. We see in verse 1 here in Mark 13, and it says this, And as he, this is Jesus, came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. That's the context. Walking through the second temple, the temple that had been approved upon by the Herods, it was actually much larger and more impressive than the temple of Solomon. And Jesus says, guess what? Not one stone here will be standing upon another. This whole thing is coming down. Now, the last couple of years, we've been looking at the history of Israel. And you know that when the temple comes down, it means God's judging hand is upon his people. When the temple's down, Israel can't function as Israel. And Jesus says, this whole thing's coming down. Verse 3. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us when these things will be, and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished. And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. That's the context of what Jesus says here in the Olivet Discourse. Jesus had a specific question that was given to him by his apostles in relationship to what he said about the temple coming down and being destroyed. And then Jesus says to them, you, you apostles, watch for these things. Going on to verse 21. And then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. False Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray if possible the elect. But be on guard. I have told you all things beforehand. Now going from verse 7 all the way down to verse 19, you've got all these different events. And again, Jesus speaks it in this manner to his disciples who asked him this question about the destruction of the temple. And here we've got the sign. We've got another sign here of false messiahs being a sign of the coming of this judgment, this apocalypse. The timing of this apocalypse is the coming of false messiahs. Now you know that there's been all kinds of false prophets that have risen up in this church age that have come over the last 2,000 years. But we do know this, when Jesus said this to his disciples, there was an increase in false messiahs a big increase in the days after Jesus had ascended into heaven and before the destruction of the temple. In fact, Josephus, the great historian, who was a Jew living in the time of the Jewish war against the Romans, who switched sides and then wrote an account of it, says this, the country was full of robbers, magicians, false prophets, false messiahs, 
and imposters who deluded the people with promises of great events. We're even told about some of these false messiahs in the Gospels. Lots of false Christs rose up before the Jewish war and led the people astray and led the land into destruction. Going on to verse 24 of Mark 13. But in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Surely this must be related to the last day. Cosmic signs. Things going on in the heaven showing God's judgment. But friends, I say this. The reason why we say that is because we don't know the Old Testament. Jesus here speaks as an Old Testament prophet does. Jesus speaks as a Jewish prophet into a context that understands this type of language. Jewish prophets speak in colorful figurative language. Let me just give you a couple of examples here. In Isaiah chapter 13, now Isaiah, remember, is a prophet who lives in the days of Hezekiah, lives in a time when the Assyrian Empire is the big empire on the scene. Babylon's actually friends with Judah, but they're rising up. They haven't become a great power yet. And Babylon will become a great power and a great persecutor of the people of God. And we see that in Isaiah chapter 13, Isaiah pronounces judgment upon Babylon. It says the oracle concerning Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos saw. This is talking about the destruction of Babylon that occurs about 500 years before Jesus. And what does it say? Some of the specifics. Verse 9, Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising and the moon will not shed its light. So we see here that the way that prophets speak in the Old Testament is when they speak of judgment. They talk about cosmic signs connected to God's judgment on earth. Let me give you one more here. In Psalm 18, we've got David, the great psalmist. David, the great prophet in the Old Testament. David cries out to the Lord that God might come and deliver him from his enemies. And it says this in Psalm 18 and verse 6. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. From his temple, he heard my voice and my cry reached his ears. Then the earth reeled and rocked. The foundations also, the mountains, trembled and quaked because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils, a devouring fire from his mouth. Glowing coals flamed forth from him. He bowed the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. Now, both these examples, they happened hundreds of years before Jesus. Cosmic signs connected to God's judgment on the earth didn't mean it was the end of the world. At least we can say this, friends, that when Jesus speaks this way, he speaks like an Old Testament prophet. And at the very least, we can say this. It doesn't mean that he's explicitly speaking about the end of this age in which we live. Let's go on to verse 26. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. And notice the context here again. Remember, this entire chapter here is spoken to some explicit people living in a specific age. Jesus told these apostles who asked this question of him concerning the destruction of the temple. What will be the sign? And Jesus said, this, this, and this. And then he says here in the set of verses we're looking at in 26 and 27, then they will see. Who is the they? It's those who are witnessing those very things that Jesus says, you apostles, watch for. Again, we see here the sign of the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Surely this sign would have to be related to the final coming of Jesus. Or is it? Going on to verse 9, back in Psalm 18, it says, He bowed the heavens. Now this is David speaking about God coming and delivering him. And came down, thick darkness under his feet. He rode on the cherub and flew. He came swiftly on the wings of the wind. He made darkness his covering, his canopy around him, thick clouds dark with water. 
Out of the brightness before him came hailstones and coals of fire broke through the clouds. But David was delivered by the Lord. It's compared here with great signs of destruction in the cosmos, in the natural world around him. And I submit that that's what Jesus is saying about the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. And what it says here, he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Notice here again, speaking to these disciples, what would this have meant? It means this, when the temple comes down, the angels go out and now gather his people from all over the earth, from the four winds, from the four corners of the earth, from every tribe and nation, and you are part of this gathering in. What's going on? The old temple is coming down. The old age is coming to an end. The new temple, the body of Christ, is rising up from people from the four corners of the earth, from the four winds of heaven. Let's go on to verse 28. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, notice this, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. The timing of this apocalypse is Israel, and it's soon. The fig tree is a motif of the nation of Israel all over the Old Testament. Jesus cursed the fig tree, and it would give no more fruit. And we see here that he says, watch the fig tree. Watch the fig tree. Watch Israel and what goes on in this nation of yours. And then you will know when these signs are going to take place. Then you will know when the temple will be destroyed. Now, some of you might say, okay, makes some sense, but I'm not buying it. Watch verse 30 now. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. The word there for generation is Ganea. And notice here that he's actually using with it the demonstrative pronoun of this generation. Ganea haute. This generation. Some people have said, well, this is speaking of some generation in the future. But friends, you know this. If you get a chance, take a look. Every time Jesus uses the word generation, I'm not talking about when Mary says that. I'm not talking about when it's used in the narrative. But when Jesus uses the term generation, it's always talking about the people in the days in which he walked the earth. In fact, I'll say this. When he says, this generation, I challenge you to find any place that Jesus uses that, this generation, that it doesn't refer to those who are living at the time when he's walking the earth. Let me give you the two examples from the book of Mark. In Mark 8, 12, it says this. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. In verse 38 of Mark, it says this, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in his glory of his Father with the holy angels. I don't think there's any other way around this text. In order to be true to the text, in order to be true to Jesus' words, we can't be like those who stand around in the 20th and 21st century and try to categorize everything into systematic theological categories and little boxes. And then we read the newspaper and we're constantly looking for signs of fulfillment of what Jesus is saying. And how many of those prophecies have been proven wrong again and again? The natural reading of this text is that Jesus is speaking to those in the first century in the Olivet Discourse. He's talking about near-term events that are going to come to an end in 70 AD. In fact, when you think about this tribulation period of seven years, right? How many of you guys remember that? Seven-year tribulation? Anybody walk in prophecy circles, you know? Well, check this out. This tribulation for Jesus would have been the Jewish war. Historians tell us it kicked off in 66 AD and ended in 73 AD. 66 to 73. How many years is that? That's right, Luke. It's seven years. Seven years. Seven years. Verse 31. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. 
we've got here this great juxtaposition of these eternal words of Jesus and the limited knowledge of the man Christ Jesus. Jesus himself says he doesn't know the day or the hour. The angels don't know, but the Father does. If the Son of Man is limited of near-term events of his knowledge, what knowledge do failed prophecy teachers have for far away events? So many of those who get on TV and write books and make movies have already said the world would end sometime back in the 80s and the 90s and it didn't happen. And yet people still listen to them and plow money into it. Whereas I believe that these events that are spoken of here in the Olivet Discourse, Jesus will come again, friends. He's coming again at the end of the age to gather his people. He's coming at the end of the age to bring judgment to the earth. But these events that we're looking at here in Mark 13, I believe are clearly fulfilled with the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem at 70 AD. Verse 33, be on guard, keep awake. Now notice this, speaking to his apostles, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves his home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening or at midnight, or when the cock crows, or in the morning, lest he come and suddenly find you asleep. The closing act of the first advent of the Lord Jesus, the destruction of the temple is an event that he tells his apostles must be watched for. And then we got verse 37 here, where I submit we find our application. And here's the thing, friends. We need to find ourselves in applications and implications from the text most of the time. We always want to find ourselves in the text. So we spend our time looking at prophecy and wondering, does it have something to say about wicked Hollywood? Or maybe the United States is in here somewhere. Or maybe it's not. Verse 37. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. There is another Advent apocalypse that is to come. Advent is about the first coming and the final coming of the Lord Jesus. In a world filled with sin sleepers, we need to be those who are awake and longing for the final advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1915, in the middle of World War I, a soldier from New Zealand, Jack Dunn, was found asleep at his post. After a trial, Dunn was found guilty and sentenced to death. Why the harsh sentence? Because the job of a sentry is to stay awake and watch. If he is not awake and watching, the enemy can slip through, bringing death to his comrades. Jesus tells his hearers to stay awake and to watch for his coming, his advent. And so are we. We who live between the advents are to be those who are fully awake, watching for our Lord's final advent. Stay awake, brethren. Watch for the enemy and scan the horizon and live in light of the fact that our Lord, King Jesus, will advent again. This morning we've looked at Advent Apocalypse. Soli Deo Gloria, to God alone be the glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless us. We ask you to help us to learn, learn from the first advent, to look and expect for the final advent. We pray that this season you would cause us to be those who go out and spread the message of the final advent to our neighbors and those around us. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we've heard from the Lord through his word. Let us respond back with our tithes and offerings, our tribute to the King. <laughs>
Rise with hands up and raise. Sing the duck song. saints this morning in Armenia. May you send revival and reformation across all Christian communions in this very old Christian nation, that your people might be refreshed in love and filled with joy. May you increase the evang uh, evangelical communions in Armenia, and may they be a blessing to the larger church there. Bless the Ang Anglican congregation in the city of Yerevan this very day. May their worship be bold and vigorous. May you bless Armenia to be a great Christian nation. Heavenly Father, renew us, and may your spirit blow mighty, mightily upon us, giving us new life. We have become a nation and people that demands instant gratification without working hard for your glory in the little things. May your people not fall into the sin, but be those who strive for excellence in all areas of life. We ask that you would revive the church and reform us according to your word, that we might be sharp as tacks in worship and do it with skill and maturity. I pray that you would give your people fearlessness to create or buttress our own institutions of the family, schools, and church courts, even as our culture decays around us. Bless our president, governor, legislators, and judges, that they might know you and fear you and give your people peace. Bless the Cardis as they assist Atherton's mother in this final stage of life. Please heal Reverend Jim Jordan from his stroke. Please heal and cheer Rob Maddox of cancer. Bless and grow the CREC Church in Porto Alegre, Brazil. Bless and mature the CREC Church in Santa Cruz and cause it to find a new pastor. Bless the CREC Church in Grand Junction, Colorado with their new pastor. Bless the CREC Church in Meeker, Colorado that they would find a new pastor. Bless the CREC Church plant in Pleasanton that they would grow and mature. Bless us here in Santa Clarita and at Christ Church. Bless the church across denominational lines to be revived and united. Bless the SCB Pregnancy Center. And may our valley continue to be an oasis of life. Cause Christian education to flourish and transform our city. Raise up godly fathers and mothers in our community to teach their children your word. Make us missionaries in our neighborhoods and workplaces. And bless us to build a cathedral in Santa Clarita. Make our marriages strong and inflexible to our culture's foolish and easy answers. Please continue to heal and strengthen Marnie Allen. Keep Jandy Hardesty and her baby safe and healthy. Bless our singles with spouses. Heal the sick among us and lift up the brokenhearted. Make us fruitful children at Christ Church. May our children never remember a day they did not know you. We thank you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with hands up raised, we pray as he taught us to pray, Say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. This is the table of Advent. In the first advent of the Lord Jesus Christ, he institutes this feast for us. But we see here that it's a feast of tokens. We get a little piece of bread. We get a little cup of wine. We receive grace through this. And yet we still are left longing. Longing for the final advent of our Lord Jesus Christ. When he will come again. And this table of tokens will become an unending feast. Kicked off with the marriage supper of the Lamb. Who may come and partake with us? If you've been baptized in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you're not under the discipline of any Christian body, then we invite you to come and partake with us. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread and gave thanks. Let us give thanks for the body of Christ. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your Son in that first advent to offer himself up 
the great bread of heaven, to be broken on our behalf, that we might be made whole to you. We thank you for him. In Jesus' name, amen. When he given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this as my memorial. And as the bread's being passed, we're going to sing hymn number 107. Make you whole. Take and eat. In the same way, he also took the cup and gave thanks. Let us give thanks for the blood of Christ. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son sent in that first advent to bring hope and salvation to your people and to bring salvation to the world. We thank you for him coming and shedding his blood to wash us from our sins white as snow. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. After the supper, he said, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it as my memorial. And as the trays are being passed, no long faces, but pass the peace. This is the Thanksgiving feast of the resurrection. Peace of Christ be with you. Thank you.
Oh, it's slimy. It looks like it's ceramic. It's so shiny. Like, what is that kid chewing on? <laughs> Brethren, the blood of Christ that washes away all of our sins. Take and drink. Please stand as we sing together the song of Simeon, which is found in our hymnals on page 182, the song of Simeon. Church, O oh Christ, send your spirit of unity, courage, and holiness. Come, Lord Jesus, come. By shedding your blood, you have purified us. Keep us ready to welcome the day of your coming. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Bring to an end the divisions between Christians. Gather us in one visible communion. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Have mercy on all who suffer persecution for your name's sake. May they remain true to you in all their trials. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Give eternal rest to all those who are dying. May the light that never sets shine upon them. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing together hymn number four, Joy to the World, hymn number four.
receive your charge for the week from the great commission of the Lord Jesus Christ, where he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. With heads up raised like good warriors of the cross, receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and grant you peace.